My name is Dr. Maggie Mapes. I am a faculty member in the Department of Communication Studies at the University of Kansas. My title is Introductory Course Director. So as we consider affordability, access, lack of diversity in the curriculum, and whose knowledge is valued in education, we're going to think about open textbooks as one way to address. And I say one way to address specifically, right? We are absolutely not proposing that open textbooks are a magical wand where every kind of exclusive practices within higher education are going to be solved or resolved. We would love that. I would love it. But of course, that's not um, what we're suggesting. Instead, we're really trying to foreground open textbooks and open educational resources overall as a tool that you can put in your resource box to address educational equity. So um, if you aren't familiar, right, what are open textbooks? Open textbooks are one type of open educational resource, one solution that are um, a material that are, are licensed to be free forever, and they need to be downloaded only once to be used freely thereafter. Right? And so um, as we think about what open textbooks are, a really important part to introduce uh, open textbooks is to help faculty understand that there are already models that exist that lead to the successful creation of open textbooks. And it can be helpful to help them understand that here's the kind of traditional publishing model. So here on the left represents how we really assume all publishing happens. And I'll speak really from my first person experience. I had almost no information about what happened behind the curtain in terms of publishing textbooks. Um, I assumed everything happened this way. And so what we know is in this traditional model, a publisher invests in publishing a textbook. Students buy that book. The funds, of course, go back to the publisher. And the publisher pays a royalty to the author, usually a very, very, very small single digit percentage, right? But of course, there's another way, there's another model. And that is instead of having a traditional publisher, you have a college or university publish the book, right? And as part of that process, it's common now for those institutions to pay faculty upfront for their efforts. This is important because many people that I talk to have this idea that the only way open textbooks happen is just by a lone faculty member being unsupported in their basement, you know, writing a book all summer long, right? Instead, what we're seeing is that there are lots of really important structures that are already in place through colleges or universities in order to reward faculty for their time. Because like I said earlier, we know that faculty and staff um, are overworked. So that ability to pay faculty up front is really, really important. Um, earlier in this model, the development of this model, there were foundations or government consortia that were funding um, open, open textbooks. But more and more, we're really seeing that colleges and universities are taking over um, as a kind of main organizing factor. So, of course, the this model allows textbooks to be free and available, um, freely shared and copied. This slide in my experience here has been the most educational for faculty um, because faculty don't know what we don't know, right? So just having comfort or knowing that on their own universities, on their own campuses, there may be already, of course, usually in, in amazing libraries, um, people who are supporting these efforts. Now, um, just note here that Publishing, the publishing process can look exactly the same in both of these models. So there can still be peer review, there can still be copy editing, for example. Um, I actually authored an open textbook and had so much support provided to me for the University of Kansas libraries. And it's possible then to publish a, a text free textbook while also really respecting the efforts of that author. And this more open model also has the potential of addressing inequalities in traditional publishing model, whose stories are told, who gets to tell those stories, often you're going to have much more editorial control on that model on the right. And this is so significant right now in a time when we have growing legislation and bans from educators about what we can and cannot talk about. Most of those are focused on social justice, right? Critical race theory is one example. And traditional textbook publishers are feeling the pressure to bend to those bands. Right? So this has led to some books published by major publishers trying to focus only on certain stories or historical narratives that dilute the content. Right? So a more open publishing model invites more players into the process and broadens that gatekeeping process in a much more democratic way. 
Um, unfortunately, not all universities do provide funding. I will say I've been noticing in my discipline a lot more cross-institutional collaboration. So being able to do some information sharing and asking what, what um, institutions do have funding that can assist in supporting multiple collaborative authors and trying to get that work off the ground. But fingers crossed that more institutions will continue to find ways to support authors in that process. So this open model is really, really um, has so much potential. And the reason that this slide is important is that it addresses the assumption that to get a free textbook, someone must have volunteered to write it, or the publishing process must be worse, which is in fact not necessarily the case. But there's one more thing that comes into play when we think about both of these models. So um, it's copyright, <laughs> right? Um, I think about um, a faculty member having to, for example, assign just one book chapter in their course. Technically, right, copyright means that they should pay a fee in order to get permission, which would grant them a license in order to make copies of that chapter to distribute to students in order to read. And of course, the model on the left here really requires copyright because it wouldn't work if copyright protections didn't exist. If, for example, um, there weren't copyright protections, it means that the publisher could sell one copy that students could then um, copy and distribute amongst themselves. So copyright is what mandates that each individual student have to purchase their own individual book because of that license. So copyright is still a really important part of the conversation when we're thinking about this model on the right, when we're thinking about open textbooks. And the model on the right also has copyright. Right. But it's different because remember that in that open model, our intention is to make content be freely available so that it can be copied, shared, that a student can keep that information uh, forever. So copyright, as it's traditionally understood, isn't necessarily sufficient. So to give instructors and students the intended rights to communicate with them what the author feels OK with them to do, we need the publisher to give the textbook a license that allows users to do those things. So we know, of course, that copyright law is extremely, extremely important, but it has limitations. It wasn't intended to help people do a core goal of open, which is to share. So instead, we need Creative Commons. Creative Commons is a nonprofit that creates licenses to help people who want to share copyrightable intellectual property, right? So just to, to clarify, um, right, open doesn't mean that the author has no rights over what they want done with that content. Instead, Creative Commons really allows authors who are writing or who are adopting clear guidelines about what is available for them to do with that content or what isn't. So CC Creative Commons as some rights reserved, it's a license on top of copyright. And it means that the creator of the work intends the work to be freely used, freely shared, and sometimes freely edited or remixed. So um, if we go back to this publishing model, right, we have the college still or university working with an author to create the book. We have, um, we still need that kind of creative common license as the last piece of the puddle, puzzle to make sense of this, of, um, this model. Now, here's just a quick note to be transparent. I am not a copyright expert. I actually remember the first time I watched Dave do this presentation and I thought I was horrified about the, uh, the idea that a faculty member was gonna ask me a complicated question about copyright and I would fall on my face, right? Um, and you might not be a copyright expert either. That is okay. Um, I think while it can feel like a barrier, if we feel a little bit unsure about copyright language, it can actually be a really great opportunity here when you're talking with faculty members. Because many, many campuses have resources or SCALCOM librarians who are the person that we can direct faculty members to in order to make sure that they get those questions answered. So remember, part of our goal in our workshop is to recenter that sense of community and encourage faculty to utilize the resources at their disposal, both as an OEN member and as a member of their own campus community. 
It can be really, really important, I think, to address that concern because faculty members may, as they listen to this presentation with you, feel a sense of anxiety about copyright, feel a little bit insecure about being able to read Creative Commons licenses, be able to make choices if they are interested not only in adopting, adopting but also in writing. So you want to foreground. We understand that you are not a copyright expert. Let's try to encourage you to get connected with people who can answer those questions and make them feel a lot more um, um, credible about making those copyright choices. So again, Creative Commons is a really important last piece of this puzzle. And under the kind of Creative Commons licenses, there are these four different components. I'll talk you through each of them briefly. So the one on the left is by, it means attribution. And all that means is that that um, textbook author wants you to know that you can do what you'd like with the book, but you want to make sure that you give them credit, right? That means um, giving them credit. I'm not sure why I'm making that more complicated, right? So just <laughs> attribution. The second is um, NC, which means non-commercial. This means that if you use someone else's open textbook in your class, you can't charge every student a dollar. Right. So again, it's just making sure and communicating, hey, we want to make sure that this content remains open and remains free so other people can't use it um, and put a price tag on it. The third is SA, and it's called share alike. What that means is if you would do something else with the work, if you would edit it or remix it, that author wants to make sure that you use the same CC license that they have on their original work. And the last is ND, which is no derivative. It's the most restrictive of the four licenses in my experience. The author is telling you, hey, you can share, you can copy, you can keep it forever, but I'm not comfortable with you making a derivative of this work. I'm not comfortable with you editing or remixing it, for example. Okay. So when we think about these four licenses, they can kind of combine and we can adjust them into these six. And this is the way, of course, that, that, um, that the CC license is going to be communicated with faculty. So it's important to think about what they mean. So um, I'm going to quiz you briefly as a good um, educator. Right. Um, in my experience, a very, very common educational resource that's integrated into classrooms is TED Talks. Right, they're great. Um, if you had to guess, or if you're familiar, do you have any idea which of these is the most commonly used for a CC TED Talk? It is this last one, the very bottom right, right? So TED Talk, they're fine with you using the work for free, keeping it, downloading it forever, right? But they wanna make sure when you do it, you're giving credit that you can't charge against students and they don't want you to create a derivative. Usually they don't want you remixing or doing anything else um, with their, their kind of TED Talk. Okay. So again, just being able to have some kind of language around these different licenses can be really, really important to make faculty feel more comfortable, even as they're making choices about how they want to integrate materials um, into their own classes. So when we think about Creative Commons, we're thinking about the ability to copy, to share, to edit, to mix, to keep or use, or some variation of these, right? Any, any CC license is going to allow you, again, to share it, to keep it, to use it, to copy it. And some of them also are really going to allow you to edit it, to remix it um, alone or with other different open resources. Okay, so open then means free plus permission, permissions. This is where that, that transition from understanding open as merely free to really understanding the important permissions or licenses that are possible um, helps us gain complexity into not just open as reducing affordability barriers, but how open practices can address other issues related to creating um, inclusive curriculum, for example, making curriculum or editing it in ways that, that speak to the specific needs of a student population. Because when we enable users to engage with the content in many ways, especially through these licensing, we get closer at achieving more equitable learning outcomes. So after hundreds of workshops that the OEN has given, it's been clear that there are some kind of common and core questions that are about open textbooks. Um, and I'm gonna kind of address some of those briefly with you here. Now, I know each of you are absolutely going to be taking this slide deck and doing present many presentations, but even if you aren't yet ready, 
These are questions that you absolutely will get from faculty, even as you're working with them in their own and on one-on-one basis. So it's important, even if you never hold a faculty workshop, again, I know you will, that you consider how you want to answer these in your own open advocacy work. Right. Um, and so, you know, please kind of think about my answers, think about how you might adjust them also um, as you work and begin to work with faculty. So the first is um, very, very common. Where do we find books? Right. Uh, the best place we're going to direct faculty to is the open textbook library. Right. The open textbook library, as I previewed earlier, is the most comprehensive catalog of open textbooks. And more importantly, even that it includes faculty reviews of about two thirds of the textbooks in this collection. This might sound strange, and it's exactly why I recommend bookmarking this. It's because the the most question, the biggest question that I get is, how do I find an open textbook? Right. Again, we're used to kind of having. Um, I'm used to in my experience as a faculty member. I'm used to getting textbook recommendations from other colleagues. Mostly, though, I'm used to getting contacted by publishing reps. They're doing that work of information sharing for me. So we need to make sure that we're kind of making the effort to direct faculty members just to take a look. So not only if they even if they don't find a book that they will utilize for classes that they have now, that they're aware of the huge repository of different um, um, textbooks that are available to them the next time they're going to do a curricular redesign in a course of their choice. So where do we find them? Open textbook library. The second question is, are they any good? Um, this is a this um, this is a question that also I get all the time. Again, it's a it's, there's a lot of myths related to what open textbooks look like in that process. Okay? So you can see here that the open textbook library collects reviews. And this is the kind of results of those open textbook library reviews. We see a lot of, for example, 4.5 to 5 star ratings on our tech on the textbooks. And the open the OEN does not request good reviews. It really does ask for honest reviews. There's no OEN member behind the curtain who is editing all of the reviews to make sure that the books you know, look better than they may actually be, right? So these are honest reviews. And it's also a reason why it can be really, really important to direct faculty members to look at the o um, open textbook library themselves, because not only will they see the kind of sheer volume of open textbooks that are available, they're able to, to go to textbooks that are in their discipline and look at both the quantitative and qualitative feedback that their disciplinary peers have provided um, on textbooks of their choice. Another great answer to this is just go ahead and take a look for yourself. We would never say that every single textbook using the traditional publishing model is the best book ever written, right? And so the invitation again for faculty to take a good look is the kind of best answer to the question, are there any good? Because it reaffirms faculty members as credible as the decision makers and as capable of making the choice and the book um, selection, the book adoption process that's best for the needs of their students. There are also examples of open textbooks that, that have one about textbook awards. This one, the Blueprint for Success in College and Career, won um, the Textbook and Academic Author Association. And this was, wasn't just against other open textbooks. This was against books who are also using that traditional publisher model. But beyond where you can find the books and, and beyond these kind of questions of quality, we are also asked if there's a correlation between open textbooks and academic academic achievement. So you might remember from the kind of problem components of the workshop, we had that really um, great yet troublesome data that showed us students had reported they'd made some choices like dropping the class or they had to fail a class because of the cost of the book. But now we actually have evidence that indicates that there is a correlation between the adoption of an open textbook and academic achievement. So this is another one of my favorite slides. Even though I'm a qualitative researcher, um, I love the data um, in a couple of these slides that's presented. So this shows the results of a large scale study, almost 22,000 students, regarding the impact of course level faculty adoptions of open educational resources. So 
Um, this data is so, so, so interesting. What it looked at, of course, is what was the change in grades and in drop fail withdrawal rates, which is what DFW stands for, drop fail withdrawal. What was that change when a faculty member moved from a non-OER to an actual OER, of course, then these results are astounding. If you look at the all students at the very bottom here, we can see that there was over an eight and a half increase in grades, and there was a reduction of two and a half um, percentage points in drop, fail, withdraw. Right? That is um, I, that's astounding. And also, it doesn't surprise me, right? Um, I, if we know that students aren't able to buy the book, they're having to make other difficult choices about access, we know that means they aren't able to participate in the economy of knowledge that's happening in the classroom. So when you guarantee that students are able to have access to the resources that they need to succeed in the class and access to the kind of terminology that you're going to be testing them on, that they'll be discussing in class, that they um, not only have an increase in that grade, but it also means they're staying in the class longer, right? They're not dropping, uh, dropping the class. They're not withdrawing from the class, right? Which again, speaks to not only that connection to academic success, it also speaks to that question of belonging, right? And helping keep the most marginalized students in our classrooms. You'll notice, for example, that while all students had a higher grade and a lower drop fail withdrawal, that Pell eligible students in particular, that second, um, that second line there, saw a substantial increase in their grade, almost 11%, and saw almost four and a half percentage point reduction in their likelihood that there will be a drop fail or withdrawal from the class. So not having money to buy course materials makes a difference. Having immediate free and forever access to course materials makes a difference. But we need to be careful, however, not to conflate open with other types of affordability initiatives. And a very, very common question we get is about inclusive access being the same as OER. If you aren't familiar, uh, inclusive access is one option on the spectrum of affordability course materials, but there are better low cost alternatives or zero cost alternatives to students. So open educational resources have the advantage of customizability, perpetual use and unlimited free access. So library um, licensed materials have the advantage of free access, but only as long as a student is enrolled, which is often what inclusive access means. You can have access to your course materials often bundled in a student fee. But as soon as you are done on being enrolled at the university, you're going to you're going to lose access. Just think about that um, from a disciplinary perspective. We enter our disciplines. We care about the content that students are going to receive. For me anyway, I think that it's important for them to consider and have access to that material for forever, not just to succeed in their major, though that's important, but to succeed when they leave. And most and many of these initiatives or traditional publishing models that are requiring access codes restrict that student access as soon as they're no longer in your class, as soon as they're no longer enrolled. And if you want to learn more about inclusive access programs, on the bottom of this slide here, which you'll have access to, you can uh, click on and check out the nine questions OpenStax would have you ask about inclusive access, um, access programs. So when we think again back to what are the main questions we're getting, um, where do we look? Are there any good? Is inclusive access the same? And a final, also very, very popular question you'll get is, are there any ancillary materials? And just like commercial textbooks, some do and some don't. Here are uh, some examples of places to find ancillary materials. Um, the OpenStax Hub, for example, My Open Math. And I want to I want to lead by saying I absolutely understand this question. I understand the centrality and importance that having access to instructor materials can mean, especially for contingent faculty members. So it's important that we really take seriously that those adjunct faculty members in particular are also having to make difficult choices because of our resource shortages. Okay. I do think, though, when we're asked this question. Um, that it can be a barrier. Of course, not all open textbooks have ancillary materials, but it can also be a great opportunity. 
In my department, for example, we decided to adopt an OER, an open textbook for our business communication class with, and there were no ancillaries. Um, instead, we um, recruited support from our department chair and we used it as an opportunity to work with GTAs on um, pedagogy, on creating instructor resources. So they made them, right? So they created a whole base of instructor resources. So again, the answer is there may be um, ancillary materials, and the OTL um, Open Textbook Library does show when those supplemental instructor materials are not. But again, there may be other ways to think creatively about, about collaborations to try to get additional resources where there are gaps in ancillaries. Now, um, those are some of the kind of core questions, but there are some other really, really cool ways that open really allows improving student success. So in this kind of section of the workshop, we're gonna answer the question, how else can open textbooks improve student success? Again, we're really interested in thinking about this question of inclusivity and students who are at the most risk of dropping out. Remember, they need to see themselves as belonging in the school. They might um, feel like an imposter and even small barriers um, can cause them to leave school. Um, I, I always really try to tell faculty, and even for myself, as I think about open, I try to help faculty understand that, you know, educational resources, our textbooks, is not additive to the college experience, that it is fundamental in contributing to the culture and environment that can either include or exclude certain um, student populations. So let's take a look at some of the ways that open textbooks might help remove some additional barriers and help them make, make them feel that they belong. Here are four ways. And for me, these next few slides are really where we see a focus on inclusivity. Because at a base level, open asks us to consider fundamental questions about the nature of our educational resources. What is working and what isn't? What have we taken for granted in our business as usual approach to educational resources? Who is empowered or disempowered in that approach? And how does open enable new potential pathways for students and for instructor training on pedagogy? So um, there are kind of four things we'll talk about here. The ability to customize the curriculum, content customization, contextualizing the curriculum, making it more inclusive and by providing opportunities for innovative pedagogy. So to begin, content customization. Um, I, I'm, I'm gonna nerd out here with you all a little bit because this is where I started to learn just how cool open really is, right? So on the left here, we'll see an open textbook that's for a low statistics, low level statistics course. Right? Now, the right is a derivative of the book on the left, and it includes content specific to learning statistics with a spreadsheet. So functionally what happened is the authors on the right realized, oh wow, there are so many very, very cool things in this collaborative statistics textbook that is working for us, but the examples and the focus aren't on using spreadsheets to learn statistics. So that customization then enables them to take what they need while making it specific, embedding examples that meet not only the needs of their students, but the specific learning outcomes that they're required to teach in those courses. Right. So again, uh, I love this as well because it helps faculty understand that, hey, creating or editing, remixing an open book does not mean that you have to start from scratch. There are so many open textbooks with such amazing authors, really, really great ideas. It doesn't mean, though, that every single thing in that book is going to meet the needs or, or speak to the experiences of the specificity of your students. So open means you can say, wow, there's 75% of terms of framing of research in this book that I love, but I, I really need to mess with 25% of it to meet the specific needs. Even for me, when I talk about content customization with faculty, I also encourage them to think about customization as integrating different open books for the same course. Because remember, with open, you're no longer bound, as I used to feel as a faculty member, to adopt just one book, even if it didn't really meet my needs because it was super expensive. 
because you're no longer bound to having cost be such a core component of your decision making, it means that you're able to go to the open textbook library and think about integrating chapters from different open textbooks that are useful for you. So in communication studies, we're really interdisciplinary. So I've used chapters on information literacy, on critical thinking, on social justice through the open textbook library. So content customization, one really great way that we can, again, um, try to encourage student success. The second is content contextualization. And here's an example. This is um, an OpenStax introduction to sociology book. Excellent. The right is an introduction to sociology, which is the second Canadian edition. Can you think of what might be different between the um, introduction to sociology that is the Canadian edition? Why would it be really important for that faculty member to say, hmm, maybe we need to do some contextualization changes? Any ideas? Spelling? language. Yes. So of course, sociology, when we think about the study of culture, right, the need to contextualize that as it relates to Canadian culture. These are great examples, being bilingual, for example, right? So being able to take uh, important information, again, studies information from that introduction to sociology book and contextualize it so that it speaks to the student experience. Next is this idea of inclusion, so diversifying and amplifying voices. Right? So open education can also empower inclusion by diversifying underserved voices. And these next two examples are really going to highlight how scientists and anthropologists notice that kind of current textbooks excluded really important and core curricular examples. Remember when uh, a little bit earlier when I was talking about the two models, right? some of the pressure that publishers are feeling to be real information gatekeepers based on calls to be restrictive in censorship, censor education. Many of that, those censorship um, gatekeeping components aren't going to be required of you if we use that open model. So this openly licensed book, Knowing Home, modified a science book with rich indigenous examples and use an overarching theme of the braid. So the book provides a window into the vast storehouse of innovations and technologies of the indigenous people who live in the, in the Northwestern um, North America. And the editors were really hoping that indigenous science examples could inspire deeper reflection regarding the underrepresentation of Aboriginal um, students in the sciences, right? It's important that we have students who can um, participate in curricular materials with examples of, with people, histories of cultural backgrounds similar to their own. And as this next book um, illustrates, open education can be inclusive by acknowledging and addressing disparities and inequities. So Explorations, an open invitation to biological anthropology, is an open textbook that was created with 41 authors who had a range of um, specialists with diverse backgrounds, experiences, gender, um, and gender, ethnicities, and perspectives. And cross-cultural collaboration was such a, poor, such a core part of creating this open textbook. So the authors were motivated to create a learning resource that supports the goal of social justice in higher education by really foregrounding their own perspective and um, trying to imbue a, a real commitment to respecting others' cultural behaviors and worldviews. Right. So again, thinking about that new open model as a way to have ownership over inclusive content creation for students. And finally, um, I'm going to provide an example of open pedagogy as an example of how textbooks can be used to produce innovative pedagogy. So open pedagogy is a model where faculty engage students as co-creators in knowledge and curriculum. And this is one example. This book is called An Ecological Approach to Obesity and Eating Disorders. Um, and what happened is that students worked with faculty to, uh, to write the book. Right? So they divided the chapters based on the five levels of an ecological model. Um, and in addition to writing their own individual chapters, they did peer review of all chapters 
teachers sort of and provided feedback. So open pedagogy is such a really, really interesting and emerging area of open education because it, it really, really takes seriously that students are contributors to their educational experience and that not only are they contributors to their educational experience, but that the process of working on educational resources can really advance their critical thinking and engage with that content. It, of course, means if they're able to write um, into that experience their own experiences, that inherently means the inclusion of diversity, different experiences within that those open pedagogical projects. And it means the creation of resources for other instructors that might be able to use that open, um, that open material in their own classes. Um, Robin DeRosa really here sums up the benefits of open textbooks when she says, quote, open textbooks save money, which matters deeply to our students, but they can also create a new relationship between learners and course content. And if teachers choose to acknowledge and enable this, it can have a profound effect on the whole fabric of the course. Now, we have um, really kind of worked then in this part of the workshop to help faculty understand not just why open is helpful in reducing financial barriers, but all of the other very, very cool ways that open means that faculty and students can engage with concepts, especially around commitments and values of, in of, of inclusivity. This last part then is this kind of call to action, right? We don't just want faculty to have this information in their brains. We really want to direct them where they can use that energy. And that's the kind of what can we do, right? What, what are some next steps? And here they are. We invite faculty to, of course, take a look see um, what is in the open textbook library already. There may be already something there that would work for a course that you're developing. So consider taking a look, consider um, ad adopting. The second is we want faculty to write a review. We know statistically that a facu faculty members are more likely to adopt if they're engaging with um, an actual review. So we want them to write a review, not just so that they'll consider adoption, but also because that's such an important service to other faculty members who are going to go to the um, open textbook library and, and look for themselves. So take a look, write a review, consider adoption if it meets the needs of you and your students, um, and also help remind faculty, hey, we understand if you're not in the cycle to be changing the curriculum now, but we want you to still sort of take a look and keep it in your wheelhouse for the next time that you have time and that you're able to make some of those changes. The Another sort of call to action is we want to we want them to raise awareness, right? We want them to talk to colleagues in their programs and in their departments. Um, I often tell faculty, they'll say, oh, I feel a little bit anxious about that ask. I'll say, hey, um, I suggest in a faculty meeting, just sharing the open textbook library. Again, just helping again, uh, other faculty know that there is already an archive or a place in mind that has those books that they can go ahead and, and review. When we think then about writing a review, right, we want them to take a look and see if there is a textbook in the open library that fits their area of expertise. If you're able, right, um, it's great if you can provide an incentive for faculty. So make sure, you know, to only promise that incentive if you are able um, to provide them with a stipend. So if you're able to, then that means that and they'll be incentivized both to attend the workshop, the, this faculty workshop, and incentivized to review a textbook in the open textbook library. So attend, review, and have that um, stipend or incentive available for them to reward them along those efforts. And here's the process, right? Just communicating with them that um, you'll have a link with an online review form. You're going to locate a textbook in an area of expertise for you. Typically, you have about six weeks after the workshop in order to complete that review. Although, you know, make sure that you have clarity when you'd like that review finished when you make that ask for faculty members. So even ask them, you know, what due date works for them, right? Sometimes it can be tricky depending on where you're at in the semester. And note that the review will also have its own open license so that we can share their wisdom, wisdom about the open textbook um, or with other open textbook projects. So um, again, the review will be posted um, on the open textbook library and the incentive will be paid. 
So you move right from really helping them understand all of those problems to considering how open um, can be an important solution. And then that call to action, really getting them toward engagement with an open textbook through um, looking, through reviewing, and hopefully, fingers crossed, through adopting and engaging with other faculty, faculty colleagues that they have in their department and on campus. And um, voila, that is the end um, of the kind of new faculty deck.